Hello, GrowWire listeners. Welcome to this episode of the GrowWire podcast. I'm your host, Jason Maynard, and I'm really excited about today's guest, Clara Shai. She is the founder of Hearsay Systems. Hearsay is a leading enterprise financial services cloud company. It's used by hundreds of thousands of financial services advisors and clients to deliver personalized relationships at scale. They use AI and amazing workflow technology. It's really kind of a new cutting edge software company for financial services. Now, Clara is a pretty amazing entrepreneur. She's also published two books on the impact of social media. She's on the board of Starbucks. She's done a heck of a lot in her life. Um, During our chat, we get to dive into some of the lessons she's learned in starting and running her own company, her advice on creating a working relationship with her board, and lots of interesting tidbits about how she's managed the changes in her own business Um, and grown her startup. So definitely, I think you're going to learn a lot about growing and managing a company with Clara. You're listening to the Grow Wire podcast, a place where you'll learn the ins and outs of growing a business, running a business, or even taking your big idea, career, or personal development to the next level. It's all possible. Our host, Jason Maynard, the SVP of Marketing at Oracle NetSuite and the Editor-in-Chief of GrowWire.com, will take you on an exploration of growth through candid conversations with some of the most brilliant minds in entrepreneurship, entertainment, business development, and more. Whatever your goal, we know you'll walk away with the right tools to help fuel your own journey of growth. Before we get into this conversation with Clara, I want to thank our sponsor, Hint. If you don't know about Hint, their brand is all about making everyday life more enjoyable. It started when Kara Golden, Hint's founder, needed a way to drink more water, but didn't want to have all the sugar and sweeteners that come in most drinks. She created Hint Water. And I have to tell you, I love Hint Water. I drink it almost every day. Um, it's just a hint of flavor from real fruit essences, and it doesn't have any sugar or sweeteners. I recommend that you try the peach one. That's my favorite. Definitely check it out. Although all the flavors are lovely, I particularly like the peach. But instead of me telling you about it, why don't you go check it out? Well, you can. Head over to hint.co slash welcome and get 30% off your first purchase right now because you're a GrowWire listener. Get on over there. I also want to make you aware of some of the new stuff over on growwire.com. Uh, This one is really, I think, an important one. September marks Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, and we wanted to do our part to help this important cause. So on this week's episode of The Grow Wire Show, that's our YouTube and TV show that we built, we have Alex's Lemonade Stand Foundation. Alex's Lemonade Stand is an amazing group. It's an organization started by a four-year-old girl who is battling cancer and set out to raise $1 million for childhood cancer research. And she was going to do this all by selling lemonade. So not only did she hit her goal, she kicked off really a nationwide effort that's continuing in her honor even after her passing in 2004. It's a great story. You definitely don't want to miss seeing Alex's Lemonade Stand on The Grow Wire Show. All right, welcome to the Grow Wire podcast. I'm here in foggy San Francisco. Of course, it's summer in San Francisco, so it's got to be foggy. And I'm with Clara, the CEO of Hearsay. Hi. Thanks for having us in. Yeah, thanks for coming by. It's great to be in your office here in uh, in beautiful San Francisco. So Clara and I have known each other for how many years? 10, 12? Something like that, yeah. It's been yeah. a long time. Yeah. I mean, now you're obviously running a company... Hearsay has been very successful. You're on the board of Starbucks, two-time author. You've done quite a lot, but I'd love to get in a little bit on how you broke into technology. You've got a kind of an interesting story, and so maybe just start with where'd you grow up, and how did you, you know, build this and, and gain this love for technology? Sure. Um, so I was born in Hong Kong, and my family immigrated to the states when I was four. Um, grew up in Chicago, and I remember being in high school and looking at the the magazine, um, the magazines in the checkout aisle at a grocery store and reading about Silicon Valley. I was 17 and I read this story about venture capital. This is 1999. I was like, I have to go out to California. Had you ever been out before? Never. 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 So I applied to Stanford and I showed up and the rest is history. And what did you study in school? Computer science and economics. Oh, interesting. That's a good background, too. Yeah. And it was just like, I mean, it's what we learned in school, but just the whole environment. Yeah. Having people like Larry Page come and guest lecture when he was just starting Google. 
it was it was amazing. Yeah. What was what was when you when you arrived? Was it what you thought it was going to be? No, I mean I don't know if you've been to Stanford campus, but it is. Full they don't of allow palm- me on. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's full of palm trees, yeah. and in the fall when you start, it's the best time of year in the Bay Area, and I just I couldn't believe that that was college. It felt like a resort. In Chicago, obviously. A little bit different. A little different. Yeah. You escaped the cold and the wind and the... You had easy living out here in California. That's right. Never looked back. Yeah. So, talk a little bit about when you when you were coming out of school, um, you did a, worked with a couple different tech companies. And well, how did you get your start? Where did you, where'd you first go? Sure. So, I first went to Google. Okay. And I worked in business operations. And I really learned the online ads business. Okay. And at the time... Advertising was becoming much more quantitative and much more metric driven. Mm-hmm. And that was fascinating. From there, I joined Salesforce.com and got to learn the enterprise software space and just saw the, the, the stark difference between the quantitative data driven aspect of advertising yeah. versus sales, which was and still is very much an art. Yeah. And I, it just got me thinking about different ideas and how could we make sales and relationships, um, how, how do we make sales more of a science? Mm-hmm. And that was definitely seeded um, my, my later interest. Yeah, We're, we'll talk a little bit about starting hearsay and how it's evolved because I think it's a fascinating story. But what was interesting, I, I met you when you were at Salesforce. Yeah. And you were one of the first people who really, uh, that I knew that really saw the business opportunity for Facebook with business. So maybe talk about some of the stuff you were doing back then because you were building connector technologies to Facebook when it wasn't necessarily a widely you know, assumed thing that that was gonna take off. Yeah, people thought I was crazy. Yeah, um, so, <laughs> I would be a little more polite, but yeah. yeah. Well, I, I graduated college in 2005. And so it was my last year there that people on campus really started using Facebook. Yeah. And so I was, I mean, that was a nice way to keep in touch with people after college. And working at Salesforce, I saw that some of my friends who worked in sales, increasingly they were starting to look up their clients and prospects on Facebook. And at first I thought, well, that's really creepy. What are you doing? And then I realized that they were just looking for some common ground and looking for mutual contacts because then they get the warm intro. They're much more likely to be able to get the person on the phone. And that was was what gave me the idea to build, um, it's kind of a funny name, Faceforce. Uh, it was an integration that I hacked together using all like publicly available yeah. APIs and technologies and kind of just went viral in the sales first community. And that's what led to my book and eventually my company. Yeah, let's talk about the book because you were that that was another kind of interesting thing for you to do. What prompted you to go write a book? Well, that, that's the thing is I, I didn't think of writing a book. I mean, <laughs> that, that was something I guess I thought I, I thought I would do in my 70s. Um, <laughs> After my app went viral, there were a few blog posts about it on TechCrunch and different blogs out there. I got approached by, um, by a book publisher, by Pearson Publishing, and they asked me if I wanted to write a book. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. What an honor. Um, couldn't turn that down. And I ended up interviewing a lot of my, my customers. I, I guess they're not customers because it was a free app. But yeah. the people who had downloaded and were using my app the most started reaching out to them. And trying to understand how they re- they were using the app, and that turned into the book. Yeah, I, I, I will credit you. I think I learned more about Facebook reading your book than probably anything else. And this oh. was like, when was it like, oh... Seven. Yeah, it was like, I was gonna say like, I think I read it in like, oh eight. Like, and I think I learned more in terms of how it actually worked and sort of the underlying, you know, data graph and what they had built and all the values, so. Well, thank you. Yeah, it was great. You've had some other experiences as well, so. Salesforce, you know, kind of opened you up into the business application world, but you've also been involved with Starbucks for a number of years now. How does that happen? So, I mean, all of these things that like 2009 to today has just been a whirlwind. Yeah. But, so my app went out, it went viral. I wrote my book that took about a year. Once my book came out, it kind of, it was apparent to me that the ideas in the book it wasn't just a book, it was a much bigger movement yeah. and there needed to be technologies created from scratch to reflect these new dynamics in the world. Yeah. And I tried to pitch it at Salesforce and you know, people, I don't know, it was like, it was just was, wasn't the right time. And so 
decided to leave and start my own company. Yeah. And about a couple of years into founding Hearsay, um, I was tapped um, for the Starbucks opportunity. That's awesome. Well, I think it's, it's fascinating to me because people talk about digitization, right? Or they make, you know, they think, oh, the world's all going digital. But if you look at most companies, they, they don't have, I would argue, a lot of the DNA of people who live or grew up in those technologies. And they don't really know how to maybe change the organization to adapt to it. And so I'm, I'm curious, like from your standpoint, when you, you know, Starbucks always very progressive company and was trying new stuff, you know, were they, were they receptive to these new ideas and how, you know, how do you, how do you sort of bring something new like that to a company that's been around for a while, even though they've, they've been on the sort of the forefront of new technology? Yeah, I mean, Starbucks is a great example of a company that's done it right because they, they sought out specifically a board member who was from the digital age yeah. and from the tech world. Um, you're, you bring up such a good point because I see this in a lot of companies where they know they need to go digital and they many actually go as far as hiring a person or a team yeah. to focus on digital. The problem is that person or team becomes very siloed from the core business. And so all these innovation labs, head of digital, head of innovation, I mean, it's nice, but it, until it's actually delivering business results, it's hard for everybody else to care. Yeah. What Starbucks does really well is they realize that digital channels aren't separate and distinct from the store experience. They're really, they have to be integrated, right? It's true omni-channel. A lot of people say omni-channel, but they actually mean siloed channels. Starbucks talks omni-channel, and they talk about you being in the store, seeing digital menu boards that are personalized for you, and then using your phone to pay with the mobile app seamlessly. And that integrated experience that cuts between offline and online and back again, that's really, I think, the future for every business. Yeah. I think it's interesting when you talk about these innovation labs or these sort of like the chief digital officers and, some, and you know, with all apologies to anybody who's a chief digital officer that's going to listen to this. Well, it's tough. But but you're not in the business. Yeah. Right? And I think a lot of them, I mean, the ones I've met, they're really smart. And the ones who are successful, though, are able to to work it out with their CEO to become much more embedded yeah. in the business. Yeah, and then that's I think that's the key is that it's got to be core to what the business is doing because if you don't change, you could change the strategy, but if you don't actually get into the organizations and think about the workflows and the processes, you will just end up creating these silos like you talk about. Exactly. I mean, you look at companies like Sears or Montgomery Ward, right? They had online managers. They had people who created websites, yeah. but because they didn't they couldn't influence the core business it, it just it didn't transform the business. Yeah. The, the, the catalog to the store, to, they were all separate things. So yeah. We're going to take a quick break and come back and talk a little bit about your decision to start Hearsay. Which American company started with a guy in a garage, was featured on Shark Tank, and now has over 1 million customers? Hint, they're reducing crime in neighborhoods everywhere. Here's Ring Video Doorbell founder Jamie Siminoff with his secret to success. It's true. In just a few years, we've had huge growth. We've hired hundreds of people, expanded our warehouse, and we're shipping millions of units a year, all while making sure our customers are happy. I've had lots of things to worry about, but I never worry about our finance and accounting because we use NetSuite from Oracle. From the beginning, NetSuite let me see what's going on with my business in real time, from revenues to expenses, customers and orders, even HR. I run my business from a dashboard right on my phone. NetSuite has been my business management system from 10 to a team of over 1,000. And NetSuite will be my choice as we continue to innovate and grow. Go to NetSuite.com slash ring to see how Jamie scaled his business. You'll also get our free guide titled Overcoming Your Five Obstacles to Growth. That's NetSuite.com slash ring for your free guide and the story of a great American company. NetSuite.com slash ring. All right. So you leave Salesforce. You see this opportunity you start a com to start a company called Hearsay. What, what was the seed or the genesis behind Hearsay? So the idea behind the hearsay was that when I worked at Salesforce, something I saw companies struggle with when it came to CRM was getting their reps to do all of this manual data entry. It's, it's like the biggest problem in the history of mankind for sales problem. automation. Yeah. Who, who wants to do that? No one. So at the same time, I saw all of this, this sharing happening on social media. And so my idea was, what if, what if Facebook was a CRM? What if it was a self-reported CRM? What if LinkedIn, mm -hmm. what if Twitter, what if all of these were actually great data sources to stay up to date? 
on what was going on in someone's life because it kind of is yeah and that's why on the cover of my first book it's a rolodex an old school rolodex but each page of the rolodex is someone's facebook profile because that's really what it's become and so hearsay was started on the idea of can we help relationship managers real estate agents avon ladies salespeople keep up to date with their network and help them hear what's happening across their friends, Mm -hmm. basically to do lead gen within their own network. And then based on what they hear, to help them say and post and share the right things that would be relevant to the greatest number of people. And so that that was a very simple idea in how we got started. Yeah, and you know, in the old days, right, in the analog world, you'd have the Rolodex and you'd pick up those visual clues when you go visit somebody at the office, right, or you, see them at the ball game or something like you find out what they like and you use that to tailor your messages yep in the digital world you've got all sorts of places you can get that signal from exactly same idea and then how we ended up in financial services is if you think about the types of signals that are shared on social media and especially facebook so much of it is about life events yeah getting married having a baby changing jobs my company going public all of these are financial services triggers yeah, so that becomes a, a, an interesting backbone to think about. When do you need to put the message into the potential prospect or even a customer, I would assume. Exactly. Yeah. Or it's, and it, it, it could just, it's a relationship. It's like, hey, congratulations, right? Because you're just, it's, it's warming the, them up. You're not going in with the hard sell because it's all about relationship selling. So how do you, you know, coming from your background, obviously, you, you saw the business side on the on with Google and obviously in B2B sales. How do you pick financial services? Like how? Because you you didn't come from that industry. No. Wasn't your you know sort of like your your original DNA? How did that end up being the place that you were going to start first? You know they picked us, so we started off with the Avon ladies and the real estate okay. agents, and we were selling onesie twosies, online acquisition, almost all AdWords, and people were paying us through PayPal. They were sending in checks for fifty <laughs> bucks every month. I remember I'd take our stack of checks and, and put them into our account. And then at some point, I think six months in, I was presenting at a conference with one of our real estate agent customers. And afterwards, um, someone in the audience who works at a a large insurance company, he told me that he wanted an order for 5,000 seats. Oh, wow. And I was like, oh, that sounds a lot better than $50 a month for one person. And that's how we became And it wasn't even going to be it wasn't even going to be in checks. They were just going to wire the money. They were going to wire us the money. Even better. Yeah. And it, and that's when we uncovered that not only do you have this life event driven trigger in financial services, but you also have compliance requirements yeah. where the insurance company or the bank or the wealth management firm, they're actually liable to supervise and capture all of these communications that that take place whether it's on email or whether it's on an emerging channel like social media. Yeah. So I want to ask you one thing on this because I think this is, if I think about even a small company, mid-size or even large companies, we all in business have a lot of ambition, right? If you're going to start a company, you're, you're by default, you're thinking about, you know, a big problem that you want to solve. How do you then focus and say no to a bunch of things and say, we're just going to do this one thing or pick this one. In your case, it was picking the financial services market to go spend all your energy. Because it's really easy to say yes, but I think it's very hard for entrepreneurs to say no. It is so true because you're always looking for opportunity and you don't want to close doors. Um, I have to say it took us a while to figure that out, probably a good two to three years um, because the first step was we took on financial services And then there was this really tough period, probably 12 months, where, I mean, the company was only maybe 12 people at the time. We were being pulled into so many different directions, right? The Avon ladies wanted one thing. The car salespeople wanted something else. The real estate agents wanted something else. Financial services wanted all this compliance stuff. And I mean, our team was just, it was, people were burned out. I was burned out. And it really... It was someone. It was our head of marketing at the time, Jalet, who said, "Look, we, we can't be everything to everyone because then we'll be nothing to anyone." Yeah. And let's look at our opportunities. Let's look at which customers are getting the most value. Let's do the market sizing um, for each vertical, and let's just say no to everything else. And that discipline it, it changed the trajectory of the company. Yeah, it's a, it's an interesting discipline to learn, and you you were kind of forced into 
making that decision. Yeah, because it was just unsustainable. Yeah. I want to ask you this. You were obviously venture-backed, so you raised VC money to start the business. How do you have that conversation with an investor when they, you know, maybe they thought it was going to be something, and you're like, hey, we're going to move the company into a different direction. Is that an easy conversation to have? Well, it depends on your investor. Yeah. And I, I feel very fortunate. We've raised from two firms, Sequoia and NEA, and they've both been amazing. And as we've evolved over time, they, they've given us guidance, they've given us feedback, but they've always let um, me own the trajectory of the company and they've been supportive. Okay, so that's never been an issue in terms of them having a hard opinion, oh, we, we gotta go one, one way versus the other. I mean, they have their opinions, yeah. but <laughs> I have the decision. That's even, that's even better. Yeah, and I think learning how to manage your board is also very important and something that I think, for me, joining an, an outside board and, be, and me being the board member helped me learn how to deal with my own board. Explain more about that. Well, I think a lot of first-time entrepreneurs, um, and certainly I, I, I fell into this camp, You, it's easy to think your board is your boss. I mean, they sort of are, um, and to listen to them, but they're not in it day-to-day. And what joining another board taught me was to push back and to ultimately own my decisions and to take the board's input as just one of many inputs. Yeah. So, how, so given that you're on a board, and obviously, you know, you're not day to day in the in the in the coffee business, if you will. Um, what advice do you give to people who maybe are in your shoes, who are looking at how do they manage their board? Do you, what What do you go to your board with then, in terms of problems? I mean, obviously, you have your regular course of business stuff, yeah. but like, what what do you ask the board for help on? Well, it depends on the the size and stage of company. It also depends on the board member. Yeah. So we've got two venture capital board members, they're good at different things. They come from different backgrounds. John, um, John Sakota, he he was a fintech entrepreneur himself in the past. Okay. So a lot of product questions, a lot of customer intros, he's my go-to guy for that. Yeah. Brian, really good at scaling, right? Really good at people and culture types of things. He's the first person that I ask for that. So so really, just like you would assess the people on your team to know who to go, f- go to for what, I would think that way about um, both your board members as well as when you're doing another round, picking your board member based on what they can give you. Yeah, no, that's a good advice. If you look back when you started the company and you went through obviously a little bit of some changes, what would be the one thing that you wish you could have done all over again? I mean, people always say it, but you, you don't feel it until you've lived through it and made the mistakes, but it's you know hire slow, fire fast. And it's so easy to say and so hard to do, especially when you, you don't know what good looks like. For me, it was my first time being a CEO, my first time being an executive, yeah. my first time founding a company. And so there were just, there was self-doubt, there were questions that um, I had to build confidence over the course of, of eight years. Yeah, is it sort of you don't know what you don't know? Exactly. Yeah. When you think about hiring slow and firing fast, were you trying to scale quickly and making a lot of hires based on hey, we need to get certain people in, a, in the seat at this time or we're not going to hit our numbers or we're not going to deliver product. And do you feel like you compromise some, somewhat on that? Yeah, of course, because you're always under pressure yeah. to, to exceed targets and to scale. Um, and just I wish I had taken the time to really understand, because it's not possible for any founder to have done every job role that they need to hire for. Yeah. But just taking the time to understand what good looks like informationally interviewing people who you know to be really good at that craft even if you don't end up interviewing them for the, for your actual job so that you have a baseline that you're trying to, to look for yeah when you when you made the couple of the changes did you find that the people that you brought in uh, for the company at sort of the stage you were at and maybe the broader focus were the right people as you narrowed your focus of the company well that's the other thing right it's it changes yeah and some people can grow with you and scale with you some people are just better at an earlier stage company with less process yeah. and so just being able to gauge that and have those honest conversations yeah. do you know how, how do you tell is there a way to is it i mean based on your experience when you saw like if you think back at the at the folks that worked and have been with you on the ride mm-hmm. and who have clearly adapted versus the ones who maybe were when you were at a smaller stage is there a way to figure that out there is. Um, I'd say the two best indicators are, are they achieving the results? And how much conflict is there internally? Because usually your broader team knows when something isn't working and usually it, it bubbles up in the form of some sort of conflict. Yeah. 
Do you find the people that didn't work were they were they asking the right questions? Was that a, was that a tell, or were they focused more on like I got to get from A to B versus, or as opposed to maybe thinking about a certain different way we could solve this? There are lots of reasons why certain people don't work out. I mean, yeah. one of them might be questions. One of them just, I mean, some people hate process. I think about, I even think about my co-founder who is still on our board, but is no longer in an operating role here. He likes earlier stage stuff where there's less certainty, less process, less bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah no, I think it's, it's, an, it's an interesting thing because you sell software that manages a lot of what I would call sort of artistic free-flowing ad hoc processes mm -hmm. and it's always interesting to me look at how companies who are trying to bring that level of discipline to an organization how on their own they structure a company yeah right <laughs> it's sort of the irony of what you're selling and seeing what works and what doesn't work and I always feel like companies that are in those type of markets have an interesting view of sort of their own challenges that they go that they go through it's true yeah because you, you, you kind of live it you know what you're trying to solve with your product and at the same time you've got to get your company align with what you're, what you're trying to do. Yeah, and even for us where we're focused on selling to financial services firms, even though we're not a financial services firm, the, the, the fundamental sales marketing alignment data problem we're solving is something that we experience every day. Yeah. We're going to take a quick break and talk a little bit more about some of the, the latest findings that you've had on your product journey and how that applies. Hey, GrowWire listeners, want to challenge your company to innovate and elevate? through laughter? Well, the Second City Works is the B2B side of the world-famous comedy mecca, The Second City. Now, The Second City has turned out some of the funniest people of all time. Tina Fey, Chris Farley, Steve Carell, all great comedians. They all came from Second City. Well, The Second City has also helped hundreds of Fortune 1000 companies inspire better performance by using their award-winning improvisation and audience-driven techniques that are powered by humor. Interested in live events, hands-on workshops, campaign, consultation, branded content, and a whole lot more? I thought you did. Well, that's why you need to go visit secondcityworks.com to learn more, and you will laugh, and so will your customers. So I, I want to follow up on that point because you talk about the broader applicability of what you're doing. And I think it's really kind of an interesting thing because most folks who are running a business, whether they're in technology or any type of sales, getting the reps to follow a process that works is a hard thing to do. And you, you always hear about the 80-20 the rule in business that you know 80% of your results come from your 20% of your top people. And it shockingly holds to be true. How are you guys solving this problem and what are some of the things that you've learned along the way that you think are gonna make this an interesting opportunity for you? So what I've learned is that, making some generalizations here, that marketing people tend to be analytical and academic and theoretical and salespeople are the opposite. And so how do you bring those two worlds together? I think for us at Hearsay, financial services, um, ironically, the compliance requirements have given us a way to address that problem because financial services, they have to capture and supervise all communications that happen. Text messages, um, you know, social media interactions, emails, website content, all of that has to be captured. Does it have to be like, that has to be, say captured, it has to be captured and stored and archived? That's right. So any, you know, if you... Any communication. Any communication, yeah. okay. Which is actually pretty incredible if you're in the data It's a business. lot of data. It's a lot of data. Yeah. And it's complete data. And for us, we started off, I mean, to use an analogy, we're kind of a compliant pipe business because we manage all the advisors' websites, their email marketing, their social media interactions, or also their phone. So as these firms move to BYOD, bring your own device, yeah. advisors don't want Big Brother capturing their personal texts and calls. So we give them a second business line on their phone, and that gives us complete visibility into all of their call activity and all their texts. Interesting. And so what we've been able to do, you know, step one has been, let's take all of that activity and surface it to the sales manager yeah. and head of sales so they can see a real-time pulse into what activities are happening and also what activity isn't happening. And then, and sometimes we, we can also, also load that into CRM. The second thing we've been able to do is 
not just measure activity, but influence activity through the use of mobile notifications, right? If the lead comes in and needs a rep to follow up in a timely manner, we generate a mobile notification. All the rep has to do is click to call or click to send a pre-templated email or text message. Um, and then we track whether they did it or not. Yeah. It's like, we told you to call, did you call? So that's interesting. So the regulatory environment that a bank or a wealth manager is forcing a level of process discipline on the advisors or in the, case of the sales reps. At least a documentation discipline. Yeah, a yeah. document. But they can't they can't sort of do things outside of these channels. That's right. Interesting. And so this is part of your change in your own business in terms of looking at how do you how do you go from sending the right message from a compliance standpoint to changing the behavior. That's right. It's like in the evolution of hearsay, we've really this is our third act. Right. Act one was we were social selling, not vertical specific. Yep. Act two was we were a compliant pipe business for financial services. Act three now is we're a data and workflows company. Interesting. So this is going back to sort of how you've managed your company. How do you then get everybody inside the company to sort of follow these acts and, and reorganize and change what you need to get done to make your customers happy? It's really difficult. <laughs> it's the hardest part, right? <laughs> it is. And I, I, we're not there yet, right? I think our company... We have 200 people now. People understand high level what we're trying to do, but we haven't yet fully mapped out what this means for each individual and how their job needs to change. Um, I'd say where we're actually further along is identifying the gaps where we need to hire teams and roles that didn't yeah. exist before. Yeah. When, when you think of when you go back to when you started the company, did you think you were going to, I mean, I, obviously things have changed, but where did you, where did you really think 10 years at your 10 year mark where the company would be? Oh, gosh, I had no idea. I mean, yeah. I, I think we were just trying to get to our first million dollars in revenue. Yeah. I mean, it was it was really about survival. And it's just been so exciting. And people ask me all the time, like, do you ever get burned out? Do you get sick sick of what you're doing? I have in the past, yeah. no doubt. But right now, it's this is the most exciting year of our company in, in the entire eight years. Yeah, you seem re, 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 not reinvigorated, but you seem super excited about how you're going to go tackle this. Yeah. It, so when I ask the 10-year question, because it's always interesting to me when, to talk to founders to see some people are like, you know what, I had this vision of where I wanted to be, and it was going to take me iterations to get there. Other times, you sort of learn from your customers in the market um, in your case, it feels like you've, you've, you know, mobile device proliferation changed your customers. Yeah. So in this case, it's kind of hard to predict that was going to happen. Do, how do you sort of, when you, when you sort of look at sort of where you go next, do you feel like the, the, the technology, if you will, influencing your customers is sort of locked and this is the, the, the right playbook, say, for the next three to five years? I think the, the, the core of what we're doing is making human salespeople more productive. And it goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of a lot of companies have defined omnichannel too narrowly as direct to consumer and then they have their core business. Yeah. In our case, we're taking these financial advisors, many of whom are still doing a lot of manual processes, archaic reach out methods, and we're not getting rid of them, right? We're not a robo advice firm, yeah. we're not chatbotting them away. We're just taking what they've done that's been rote and ineffective and digitizing it and providing all the analytics around it. Do you, do you call yourself an AI company? Well, doesn't everybody these days? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too many people do, probably. Yeah. Do, you, do you use that word, though? We, we do, because we actually yeah. are. Yeah. And, and the nice thing about AI, so two things that help our AI. One is human-in-the-loop AI. Right? If you're going to automate the sending and outreach to customers, you have to get pretty close to 100% accurate for it to, yeah. to work. When you have a human in the loop, when you're merely suggesting something to an advisor, you can get 80 or 90% of, of the way there, and that's fine because they can, in a split second, determine what the right action is. Yeah. So that's been a huge thing for us. The second thing that helps our AI is being domain specific. Right? When we classify conversations that advisors are having with their clients, we're not trying to classify out of an infinite number of possibilities. We're trying to classify against the 31 things that wealth advisors are most often talking to their clients about. Yeah. And it just, that structured framework makes it a lot more accurate and a lot easier. Yeah, your potential outcomes in terms of the scenarios are not as, as vast exactly. as if you're trying to find a, something else generic. Yeah. yeah. When, so when you think about where this, where this kind of plays out then, um, 
And I, and I and I think AI has been overused <laughs> as a former analyst. I cringe when I hear those terms yeah. these days. But um, I guess my view, and I'm I'm curious where you see this, is that I feel like there's a lot of generic conversations about AI in the media, um, but it feels like the practical applicability is going to be in these sort of this is how the process works today. How can we use intelligence to make it? better for either a customer or the, the folks involved. Yeah, it really is domain-specific yeah. optimization. Yeah. Right? Even Google's self-driving cars, right? The algorithms aren't trying to solve for world hunger and world peace. Like They're just trying to figure out, do I go straight, do I stop, do I turn left, or just turn right? Yeah. It's a narrow, a narrow set. Yeah. Do you, is, it fair to th is it fair to think of it almost flipping the, the, the term instead of artificial intelligence? Is it almost more like intelligent assistance? I think so. It really is. It's it's domain specific intelligence, yeah. and it, because it's constrained possible universe of, of outcomes and actions, and it's very applied, right? We're not trying to to be this like its own consciousness. Like it's yeah. it's just trying to figure out yeah. the next best action. <laughs> it's not going to take us over, and you know, not yet, not yeah. yet. How do you how do you um, with with your customers? I think it's kind of a fascinating thing for for folks to to consider. You've got. A customer base that in some cases they work for the organization, other cases they're contractors, right, or they're you know they're affiliated. How do you take something like an AI or intelligent assistance technology and get the average, let's say, financial advisor to use it and embrace it? Is that a hard thing to do? Do they is it is it something that they want to take advantage of or do they push back? I think it's all how it's positioned. We never tell the advisor, here's an AI for you. Right? Yeah. They would, like, what does that even mean? Instead, we say, um, Kendall just came in as a lead. She wants to buy auto insurance. We know that if you don't call her within two hours, she's probably going to buy from someone else. The conversion rate drops off exponentially. Call her now. Right? Behind the scenes, there's a lot of AI yeah. to get to that, but they don't need to know how yeah. the sausage is made. Okay. So they look at this as like, oh my gosh, this is helping me. Close business. Close business. Yeah. And that's a much easier sell. Yes. We've got a few minutes left. I want to I want to ask you a couple other things. So when you, now that you've been through this sort of entrepreneurial journey, what are the two or three things, if you kind of look back at, at, you know, where you've been, that you see folks making mistakes on in similar journeys that you've been to? Sort of what are the two or three things that you'd say, avoid these, don't do this, don't do that? For other, for other folks who are starting companies. Well, we talked already about the importance of focus. Yeah. And I mean, it really is, it's not just what you do, it's what you choose not to do. And being very explicit about that to your whole that. organization. And the bigger you are, the more important it is, actually. What not to do. What not to do. I like that. The second one, we talked about how to manage your board and how don't let them, don't let the, ta the tail wag the dog. Right? You are the one who lives it every day. And be humble, take feedback, but you have to own the decision. Yeah. Um, third, I'd say... I I try to do everything myself for too long. And in the early days, it's really helpful as a founder to be... To you have, have to. You have to, exactly. But just knowing when to let go of what, but still have the appropriate, ask the right questions, uh, appropriate level of oversight. Um, that, that is more art than science, but I think it's, it's critical and it's something that I, I'm still working on. Yeah. So what's the next for you? You know, hearsay, it's... Um, I, th I think we're just getting going, and I'm I'm really excited about changing this just like very old archaic industry. Well, I'm excited for you. This is really good stuff. I appreciate you taking the time today. Everybody's got to go check out hearsay. Thank you. Thanks, man. All right, everybody. Thank you for turning in to this edition of the Grow Wire podcast. Big thank you to Clara Shy from Hearsay for her time and all the valuable lessons we learned from her and her experiences. I also want to give a big thanks to everyone who made this possible. Our sponsors, of course, Hint, Ring, and The Second City, as well as our producer, Kendall Fisher, and our editing crew over at Lambstand. Adios, everybody. You just listened to the Grow Wire podcast with host Jason Maynard. Make sure to tune in every week for another episode full of tips, tools, and strategies to take your personal and professional growth to the next level. Until next time. <laughs>